All right, I am a bit impatient, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined. Um, hello, uh, and my name is Alexis Williams. I'm EVP of the Stagwell Group, and welcome to our eighth webinar in the Back to the Future series. Uh, we kicked off these webinars as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, took hold and really started shaping and changing the way we live our lives, the way we uh, work with each other, and the way we all sort of represent different brands. Um, and so the goal of today's conversation is really to uh, bring some fascinating people together to share insights, big ideas, and how they've been thinking about uh, evolving their business and their personal lives in the wake of this crisis. So um, as we navigate reopening, it's clear that the world, the new world is going to more, look more like the future than the past. So uh, as we've, uh, over the last several months, we've talked about creativity, digital transformation, reputation, brand evolution, and so much more. For today's conversation, we'll be talking specifically about creativity and how COVID-19 has been a catalyst for reimagination of everything from how we lead our lives to how we do our jobs. COVID-19, to say the least, was a shock to the system. It forced us to stay home. It isolated us. It took us out of the habits and routines that have driven our day-to-day -day lives for so long. Um, um, yet amidst the concern, the fear, the uncertainty, there's been an incredible amount of evolution. As individuals and, and as brands, we've had to rethink what we do, how we do it, and it's also forced us to ask why. Why are things the way they are? And should they importantly stay that way? As an eternal optimist, I think COVID-19 has spurred incredible innovations, a focus on what matters and shed a light on where we all could do better. So in that vein, today I'm very excited to talk to our panel about how creativity has helped them adapt, engage with their customers in a new way and importantly paved a path forward. Today we have some great guests and I'm going to go round robin to let them introduce themselves. Um, so starting off, I, Catherine, would you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me uh, join your conversation today. I'm Catherine Cullen. I am the Senior Director for Industry and Consumer Insights at the National Retail Federation. So we represent retailers across the country of all sizes um, in all sectors. And I'm excited to talk about how we've been thinking about creativity in terms of how we serve our members and, and what we've seen our industry do as well. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Andrew? Hi, everyone. Uh, and thanks, Alexis. Uh, I'm Andrew Strickman. I head up brand uh, at Realtor.com, uh, one of the largest online real estate search sites in the country. And, um, you know, I think that the pandemic really uh, demonstrated to us how challenging life can be when we are all um, suddenly forced to stay home 24 7 and it really also forced us to think about how we represent home uh, out there in the world in our advertising and our media in our, and creatively but also uh, the importance that home has now started to take in people's lives and, and the shared experience we've all had together um, and it's forced us to really make some positive changes in how we do business and I'm um, excited to talk about it today. That's great. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks for joining us. Uh, Marcella. Hi, Marcella Salazar, Managing Director at SKDK Knickerbocker, which is a Stagwell, a proud Stagwell company. Um, I work a lot in communications, public relations, advertising. Um, we're a issue-based uh, firm on the progressive side, um, and so one of the things I'm excited to talk about is how we've guided our corporate clients and even some of our nonprofits um, in messaging and the pivot in messaging during this uh, this time, as um, Alexis calls it, the Bermuda Triangle of social unrest, uh, economic global meltdown um, and recession, and obviously a global pandemic. So I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and before we jump into the questions um, and the conversation, a couple things. First of all, um, you are an incredible group. Please contribute, uh, bounce off of each other. Um, and additionally, we'll be soliciting question and answer from the, the audience who's joining us online. There's a Q&A button at the bottom. Please use that to submit your questions and I will filter them throughout. Um, the, 
this conversation is going to go for about 45 minutes um, and we will have a recording available online afterwards so you, everyone can plan their days. Um, and now before we get started, um, I just want to, I think everyone's audio is good, but in case we have any problems, we will um, certainly adapt. So I think with that, we're going to get going. Um, so before we talk about the COVID world, which is obviously the one we're living in, um, we see we have a lot of interesting businesses represented here, but at the center of all of them is really the consumer and their desires. Um, before the pandemic, how did creativity fit into your decision making and planning and what really drove your creativity um, before you were all sort of homebound? So I guess, Andrew, maybe start with you there. Yeah, I, you know, I think creativity is a, um, it's a very broad word uh, in the world of advertising and, and, and media and marketing, which is where sort of my role sits. Um, it is how we tell our story and how we differentiate ourselves uh, in a crowded uh, industry. Um, and it's, you know, really how we brought our brand to market um, eight years ago. I mean, Realtor.com is an almost 25-year-old brand. But up until eight years ago, we hadn't really marketed much to consumers. And uh, when we began doing that, we really leaned in to getting as creative as possible, particularly because we didn't have that much money to spend. And um, we landed on humor as sort of a, a, a driving force behind the creativity that, that, that drove the brand forward. Um, clearly, um, as we came to a, a precipice with the pandemic and, and the entire real estate industry uh, fell down for about six, eight weeks. Um, it wasn't a time to do much laughing, right? And so we really had to pivot uh, to a much more uh, empathetic and and um, message that really drove um, our belief in the shared experience that we were all going through. Everybody had a different story to tell and a different experience they were having, but they all sort of, um, uh, were in this big pool of people who were trying to figure this out together. Yeah, and Catherine, so um, obviously you represent a range of retailers, small to large. How do you think, where was creativity coming from there? How did you sort of enable that within your members and what did you see as some of the big trends shaping there? Yeah, so, um... As you mentioned, we, we represent a lot of retailers. I, I think our, our board, for example, has the CEO of Tractor Supply and the head of LVMH. So it gives you an idea of kind of the breadth Diversity, of, yeah. of, um, of retail that we represent. And, you know, I, I think both for our members and, and for us as a company in terms of how we operated, you know, I think creativity was, you had a longer timeline for it, right? Um, you could have massive brainstorm sessions. You could look at time horizons that were out, you know, 18 months from now. You know, you could look as an industry at the evolution of e-commerce and the evolving nature of the store, and you knew it was important to adapt. However, 90% of retail still occurred in a store environment. So you had a lot of, of leeway. And then all of a sudden, end of March, I, I resin, uh, what Andrew said really spoke to me as well. Um, retail shut down for the most part, um, with the exception of, of essential companies. And that created obviously a ton of pressure. Um, and I think, um, not to drag this on, but it, you know, just three things that have really kind of stood out to me in terms of what we're seeing from our members, what we're trying to facilitate, um, and what's really kind of driven success during this time and, and successful creativity. I think it's really forced companies to clarify their priorities. Um, I think pivoting from, you know, we're just selling a product to the safety of our customers and our employees is number one. And uh, we have to be aligned around that first. Uh, I think that has helped them in terms of coming up with creative solutions by having that as a priority. As I mentioned, this, this speed and, um, the speed of change and transformation, we've had members tell us that um, they've had to roll out solutions in two months that would normally take them two years. Um, and as part of that, I think you have to be willing to accept some risk and, and even some failure um, and be able to pick yourself up and not necessarily, you know, go forward with a full-blown uh, process or solution. You have to kind of roll things out on the fly. Um, and that, I think, means embracing, you know, some change. And then the final thing is just really... Um, 
re-examining what you offer in terms of value. And, you know, we've, we've encountered this as an organization that puts on events, um, you know, the value of an in-person event, but also what we're seeing in terms of, um, from our member companies, we're hearing from them that, you know, it's not just about a product anymore. And, and many of them weren't just focusing on product, but a lot of it is about content now. It's about service. It's about acknowledging what else is going on in their customers' lives. And, and that's the value and the role that they're playing. And recognizing those things and, and kind of using those as your guiding po points, I think, helps um, come up with creative solutions right now rather than kind of just stagnating. Yeah, that's great. And Marcella, you work across a range of, of clients, both um, for-profit, nonprofit, political. Tell us a little bit about what sort of sparked creativity across those um, previously. So I think, well, in the case of um, political uh, candidates, obviously there's polls, there's research, and then the, each party has their platform, right, that they can't ignore. Um, but I think across the board, what, um, first the coronavirus pandemic, and then the economic crisis, because we have to remember many Americans still don't have jobs, right? Um, and every day are trying to figure it out for their families. And then obviously the social unrest with um, Black Lives Matter and all of the protests. I, what I've taught um, or uh, asked my clients to think about in terms of messaging are kind of two things. Number one, listen and learn. Usually as an advertiser, you have a message, you want them to buy, you want them to consume, or a political candidate, right? You, you have a platform, you have a message. I think we're doing a lot more listening to people, whether they be voters or consumers, and learning. And there's a, more of a humility, as there should be, um, during this time. And then the second um, piece I've been talking to my clients about is empathy. It's like kind of like the second step, empathy and hope. So after you've heard, after you've listened, after you've acknowledged, what um, have empathy, show empathy, um, and not in a fake way, right? And, and empathy should come with an action plan. What are we gonna do, not just words? And then hope is the ultimate pivot. What can you offer your audience, your customers, uh, even your employees internally? What, what can they look forward to? What, what hope can you, can you offer them? Um, and you know, for those of us who, who also work on, um, you know, for CPGs or you know, companies, brands, for profit, if people don't feel good, they are not going to consume. Um, they have, if they have too many things on their plate, too many things to worry about, whether it be economic or people getting sick around them or worse, they're not going to consume. So hope is um, it, it acknowledges what's going on, um, but it also there is a positive aspect to that. So. I, that, that's what I've been telling my clients. Yeah, and I want to. Oh. Oh, can I just add one 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 thing, um, which is that I think the other important change that that we found. I mean, Catherine talked a little bit about the the speed with which uh, her clients were uh, forced to make changes and decisions that they had never considered or were going to take a long time. Similarly, in a in sort of the world of of marketing and advertising, you know, you have sort of a a timeline, right? You have an expectation about when you're going to roll out new creative and when you're going to shoot new creative. And we threw our timeline out the window. Mm -hmm. um, we, we went from thinking about things as campaigns to thinking about sort of much more of a rolling messaging uh, platform where we had to be very cognizant of what the country was facing at any given moment. Um, whether it was the pandemic or whether it was racial unrest and, and social justice. And um, we had to be ready to respond as well as be prepared for what the next step was, right? The economy opens. Well, what happens if everybody goes back into lockdown? And, and, and really being much more cognizant to, Mar to what Marcella said about listening. Um, and a little bit, of, a, a lot of listening to consumers, but also a lot of sort of reading the tea leaves, right? And being prepared in a way that we we never could have considered a pandemic before like this. And yet here we are and everyone uh, uh, stood up and, 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 and was able to respond in their own way, um, some probably more easily than others. However, I think we, we as a country have made it through um, or are continuing to try to make it through and try to make it work and um, not being time bound, I think was one of the biggest lessons that we learned in, in this whole thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think the organizational shifts that people have had to make in terms of the response, the, the fail fast and try again and mm -hmm. iterative is definitely something we've seen. You know, Catherine, looking across the retailers it, that NRF represents, do you, are there some really great examples you've seen of people who have pivoted, even potentially failed on the first attempt, but pivoted quickly and you've really sort of seen the uh, starts and stops, but really ending up in a good place? Are there some examples that come to mind? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, it's if there's a silver lining to all of this, I think the the innovation that has come forward, and, and I think we were talking a little bit about this before yesterday about kind of democratization of some creativity. I think organizations are open, more open to ideas from sort of any corner um, at this point and willing to try a lot. Um, in terms of specific examples, you know. I'm a, I'm a data geek. So uh, one that I really liked is um, a, a major home building company that we work with. Uh, they have a really, really large store footprint. It's over 144,000 square feet. And when social distancing guidelines came out, they knew that they were important and they knew they needed to enforce them in the store, but that's a massive amount area to cover. Um, and so they started using their um, foot traffic data in new ways and looking at what are our hot spots, where's social distancing actually a problem, and let's focus on those areas first just to better utilize our employees and better utilize our customers. It's a very tactically focused um, solution, but, um, you know, I think I was touching a little bit on pivoting to content too. We've seen, um, you know, restaurants who they're not able to let you sit at the chef's table anymore, but they'll, the chef will host a Zoom cooking class and they'll deliver all the ingredients to you and it's more of a communal event. Um, I think stuff like that has been really exciting and um, really an acknowledgement that we're all experiencing this together. And then of course, you know, there's been a pivot. We've seen so many retail brands making masks to support their customers, to support employees, um, and to you know, fill a gap when our supply chain was slowing down and, and we couldn't import some of the things we needed. So those are just a few that, that I really like and have, have witnessed. Um, and you know, I don't know if you guys have been seeing this as well, but we've really seen as an industry a real pulling together. Um, when a lot of retail employees lost their jobs, you saw an NRF was actually part of this, which I'm very proud of. We um, hosted a job board where employees who had been laid off could find jobs at other retailers because, you know, some were hiring at, at massive scale. And um, I think there's a, there's a sense of unity that I think has been really positive through all this. Yeah. Marcella, are you seeing any sort of through lines from your client in terms of, in your clients in terms of innovations, really sort of interesting ways that they have pivoted their businesses that you think um, stood out and really brought people together in a, in a great way that wouldn't have happened were it not for this pandemic, to use Catherine's term, the silver linings of this? Yes, absolutely. Um, I work with a local union um, that represents uh, meat packers. Um, it actually represents the the plant where um, that's that unfortunately has had the majority of deaths and um, it's a small community and um, obviously normally there would be funerals there would be where the members could get together um, but that wasn't possible so um, what the union did which I thought was so smart um, and it was really affecting the whole community is they took out two billboards um, for eight weeks um, to honor them with their faces, their names, because they're not just numbers, right? These are people. Uh, in the news story, their numbers are usually not even named. Um, and then they did a drive-by memorial. Um, and so people got into their cars and it, there was a sense of joy as well. Um, they wore the, um, obviously being Colorado, people are into the Denver Broncos as were some of the people who passed away. So they, in their honor, they wore their, you know, Denver, uh, Bronco gear and, um, you know, uh, people stood on top of cars with bullhorns and gave remarks, you know, at a social distance while the next person came and, um, you know, people were able to come together and grieve. Um, and I thought that was, and, you know, every, every day for two months, they'll be looking at that billboard and, and knowing that their union cares. So I thought that was a, a really smart way to, to honor, honor those who have, who have passed. Um, and, that never would have, I mean, 
a drive-by memorial, we would have all laughed in February. Uh, we probably would have even thought it was disrespectful, right? Um, but uh, not knowing what we know now. So I, I think that's, that's a really good example. Yeah, I think that's um, definitely hard, but a, a good memorial, like you said, to in the, in the worst of times. Um, mm -hmm. I think that sort of brings me to another question for this group, which is um, while COVID has in some regards been a collective experience in that everyone is um, uh, experiencing the same sense of fear, the lockdown, the um, sort of same challenges, uh, it's also very individualized. So, you know, there are people who are, uh, there are populations that are disproportionately impacted, specifically in the BIPOC community. Um, there are, uh, there's mass unemployment that's, um, you see women um, in large, uh, large amounts having to retreat from the workforce to pick mm -hmm. up on caregiving. So the question here is really how are you thinking creatively about meeting people where they are and are you thinking differently about reaching audiences and communicating with different audiences knowing that while there is sort of this collective um, experience we're all in, there's a lot of nuance to how different people are experiencing it. So how are you using creativity and smart thinking about your audience to, to really reach people and do so in a way that um, is, is thoughtful and compassionate and has the empathy that Marcella talked about. So I don't know, Catherine, you, you work a lot with data. Maybe if you could start sort of how you guys are thinking about that. Uh, sure, yes, it's a great question. It's uh, definitely something we've been thinking about. As I mentioned, and I, you know, we felt that as an industry, COVID was impacting us on, on a number of fronts, not just the individual fear uh, that everyone was having, but you know, a lot of grocery workers were, in a sense, putting themselves at risk every day, um, you know, going to work to make sure people had the items that they need and could get access to them. Um, in some ways, you know, we were, we were I mean, I don't think it was an accident, it was called an essential service. Um, but it, on the other hand, you know, a lot of people lost jobs. and. I think as, a, as an organization and as an industry, um, there's been a lot of acknowledgement of, of the pain that's going on and the, the employees who are particularly vulnerable. I think we've also seen this in the, in the wake of George Floyd's murder um, as everyone's wrestling with that and acknowledging the pain that certain groups of people are, are feeling right now. Um, so I think, there's just been a greater sense of, of vulnerability um, and acknowledgement that of, of the pain that is going on. And I think that's carried through in our, in our communications. Um, some of the initiatives we, we've been helping to work on are things like um, reevaluating our foundation efforts and our grants to make sure we are helping those who have been most impacted. Um, we, for example, provided uh, free retail training uh, for over two months, thanks to some of our partners, so that people who were looking for jobs could get a credential that might help them. Um, we've also helped do things like um, a lot of college kids didn't get their summer internship this year, and that can be a big player in, in terms of future career advancement. Uh, so we're hosting through our foundation a, a series of basically a virtual internship where they are getting um, face time with major companies and learning uh, things they might have learned in the workforce. Um, and I think we're over 200 students are participating. So um, we're trying to go out there, it gets back to what I was saying earlier about value and the value that we offer. Um, and one of the values that we try to offer our industry is, is helping them recruit and retain talent, um, but refocusing that in the time of COVID to really help those who have been impacted. So those are just a couple of ways we, we are thinking about it right now. Yeah, and Andrew, I think, you know, one of the things you talked about with early on was the humor had sort of been the, um, a brand identity for realtor.com and been really a part of your, your ethos and that you had to sort of uh, in a moment of dire consequence, pivot away from that. As you're emerging, do you think there needs to be more nuance in messaging? Do you think there needs to be sort of more unification? Like how do we, how should brands be thinking about that? Yeah, you know, it, it, if you had told me six months ago that in the course of a few months, um, the nation would be facing multiple 
reckonings, right? Whether it's from uh, a public health perspective or social justice and racial unrest. Um, I, I would have said, well, realtor.com doesn't really have a role to play in either of those, right? I mean, we don't, we, we're a site where you can find homes. We believe everybody deserves a home and, and needs, needs a home of their own, but um, how could we be part of those conversations? And, and starting with the pandemic, I mean, we, we did immediately pivot. We, we worked with our, our creative agency and developed what we called uh, a manifesto, which was basically an ode to home that ran in uh, uh, full page ads in, in print newspapers around the country. Um, but we also realized that we could do something more and we made a, a substantial six figure donation to Feeding America to help with food insecurity in the early days of the pandemic. And, and that was very important for us as a company, but also for all of our employees to, to feel like they were working someplace that, that had a heart. Um, and as it relates to what's going on, uh, uh, at the same time uh, with, with Black Lives Matter and, and, and George Floyd's murder and, and all of the emotion that's been stirred up and all of the protest that's been stirred up as a result of that. Similarly, um, you know, Realtor.com feels that we do have a role to play in the conversation about housing equity uh, and access to fair housing. Um, there is a, a long institutionalized history of racism in the, in, in the home selling, home buying and selling uh, in the real estate market uh, in this country, some of which was federally driven um, and some of which was driven at a local level. But um, we haven't quite figured out what, how we're gonna participate, but we know that it is a next step for us. And so constantly thinking about those things while still eventually in our marketing, coming back around to using humor to tell important stories um, has been valuable for us. And, and we did launch a campaign a few weeks ago that that both leans into this uncertainty and shared experience we all have at the moment around the pandemic, but also starts to make people smile and laugh again. And I think that right now we do all need some laughter uh, alongside uh, the challenges that we face. Yeah. And Marcel, anything from your side? Yeah. I, you know, I do agree that levity is important. Um, and I, there is, um, appropriate levity, you know, for the time. I can think of two ads um, that are running now um, that I that I think are, that, that make me laugh, smile, um, but that, that um, I don't remember the company, sorry, um, but it's a, a TV ad where there is a home visit to um, a elderly care center and there's a glass window and it's the grandkids like making faces and, you know, doing silly things and the grandmother's dying laughing right because that's the only communication that they can have like that is a perfect example of an ad that um it's inspiring it made me laugh it was heartfelt and it's so true because the people are doing that like you see it in the news right so it's 100 percent authentic um and i think that's going to be the, the sweet spot for advertisers um the other thing i wanted to mention is about racial equity I think um, you know, I've been discussing this a lot with my clients and working on it. And I think the biggest uh, advice I would give to any employer, any company um, is how are you treating your own people, right? Um, look inside. It's good to do outside. Donations help, right? Um, I'm, I'm all about donations to organizations. They need it. They need it. Um, but look inside your own house, clean your own house, figure out, you know, do we have institutionalized problems? Do we, you know, how many people, what does our board look like? What does our senior leadership look like? How can we change that? Um, and so I, that, that would be my advice because in the age of internet, I mean, obviously working in crisis communications and PR, in the age of internet and in the age of like everything can be found on the phone, um, there's a lot of shaming going on as well. Um, and so I think once the, the press releases go out about this million or that million or that 500,000, um, there will be people digging, whether they be reporters, employees are disgruntled. You see this a lot in tech. We've all heard about the walkouts at various companies um, and the consumers, right? They can turn on you. So I, so I, my advice would be um, just always thinking uh, from a PR crisis point of view is um, put your money where your mouth is, but also um, you should be doing the right things internally. Yeah. Just to build on that really quickly, you know, I 
something that I've been really interested in, and this is not uh, something we are affiliated with, but um, I'm sure people have seen the pull up campaign. Um, and one of the things I think is really interesting there is in you know six months ago, no one would have shared the racial and ethnic makeup of their company and publicly put it out there. And you are seeing brands publicize this data and not in the sense of, hey, look at us, we're doing a great job, but hey, we, we have room for improvement and this is our commitment to change. And um, I think that there is a moment to be transparent right now, even if it is not completely um, building yourself up, um, but I think it shows that internal change that is hopefully aligned with what you are, are doing externally as well. Um, and then I, something else you said, Marcella, that, that sparks something we've been thinking about too is, you know, it, it's not like consumers just woke up in May and cared about values. This has been something that has been building for a long time where it's occurring in a very high pressure situation. But we were looking at this at the beginning of this year, you know, values, uh, consumers' um, values around things like social tolerance and equality have been growing. People talk about how Gen Z really wants to work for companies that align with their values. Um, and, you know, we might have been talking a little bit more about sustainability at the part of the first part of this year, but um, all of these forces are kind of coming into play. And I think it's important to remember that these are long-term trends and not just something you need to do right now. Um, I think to what Andrew was saying, your actions and next steps for the future, um, because it's not, even if things sort of go back to some sort of pre-COVID life, um, consumers are going to still be shopping based on their values and choosing brands based on their values and choosing where to work based on their values. Um, and I think that's something we all need to, to remember. Yeah. And I think, you know, I want to pick up on something, Marcella, you and Andrew both mentioned and Catherine, you alluded to as well, which is like um, your employees and your staff and how do you, you all have big teams, you work um, with a lot of different people. I think if we look at the workforce now, we have somewhere about four generations all simultaneously coexisting, all of whom come with different backgrounds, different experiences, and different expectations of their employers. Taking us back to sort of where we started the conversation, which is how at this moment are you keeping your, your teams motivated? How are you keeping them creative? How are you continuing to push them to think about things in a really innovative way? What are some practical tips, everyone listening in, um, who are in the, the marketing, the advertising, um, the brand space? How are you helping keep them um, engaged, keeping people engaged and really doing great and excellent work on your behalf while balancing what we all need to have, which is a lot of empathy and sympathy for all the craziness going on in the backgrounds of our lives? I was going to say bourbon, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it is a, I think it's a challenging time to be an employer and it's an extremely challenging time to be an employee. The number of companies that have gone through furloughs, layoffs, um, not only do those experiences have a negative impact on those who are directly impacted, but on those employees who remain, they're either left with more work on their plates, they're left with a sense of guilt or a sense of mo uh, demotivation. And I think that, and, and I think across our company, everyone feels as if we're working harder than we ever have before, which is amazing because we're all working from home or not, not everyone is right. But um, my company, everyone is working from home and it's sort of like, well, you sort of have access to other time. And, but I think I sort of feel like everybody's expectations are also heightened as to what people are supposed to be doing. I mean, and I think the conversation that's going on right now uh, about both the economics and the psychological impact of working mothers or single parents and the, the multiple roles they're having to juggle right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and even the inequity between parenting between men and women uh, is coming more to, is certainly coming more to light during this time. Any, anyone who has children at home understands that. But um, I think, you know, you've got people who, who work with you, you've got to take care of them. You've got to, uh, listen to them and, and be empathetic and you know we're we're just trying to we're just trying to get along like everybody else is and so i think the more that that teams and employees can feel 
both supported, but also um, in the shared experience together, the better off everyone will be. Yeah. I think um, I'll be the first to admit that it took a global pandemic to make me a better human being. <laughs> and, that, and that means at work as well. Um, what I've really learned um, is empathy. And, you know, I used to just be all about the business. You know, you go into the office, you're all about the biz, quick, quick, quick. Everything's fast, you know, phone, email, text, everything blowing up at the same time. And what I've done is really taken a step back um, to understand where everyone, you know, that works with me, where they're coming from. I periodically do calls, just one-on-ones unannounced. I check their calendar and I call them. And oh, First thing is like, what do I owe you or am I in trouble, right? And I'm, I, I authentically am like, how are you? What's going on? And the stories that I've gotten and what I've learned from people about what's going on in the background while I'm asking them for XYZ work and they have XYZ deadlines has been really humbling. Um, we've had people in the office who've lost parents. We've had people in the office who um, have had parents with COVID and now can't work and have a, maybe you know, a dire economic situation. So they might have to be uh, dealing with young children and, and paying for older parents uh, to live because they don't want them to be exposed to the disease again. Um, and so I, I think empathy goes a long way and, and it can't be fake empathy. Um, and then also cutting people breaks. I do agree with Andrew, um, lines have kind of blurred and because we're at home working. And somebody uh, recently told me something that I totally agree with. We all say working from home, working from home, working from home. But they said, we're not working from home, we're at home working. So we're doing, we're working, but we just happen to be at home. We're doing everything we would at the office, sometimes even more, and it complicates everything because we're at home. We got kids in the background yelling, you know, people at the door, all kinds of homeschooling, all kinds of things. And so I think checking in with people and then depending on their situation, giving them a break, giving them a mental health break. Um, that's one thing that SKDK has done. Uh, we, ever since the pandemic, I think we've had two or three, everyone gets their day off. Uh, no, you know, don't interrupt them with calls or emails or texts, leave them alone. Um, and just for people to recharge. And last I'll say, and I know this sounds uh, very Mr. Rogers, but just being kind, being kind. Um, you know, as a manager, um, it, you have to, you know, again, when you're all about the business, it can be very dry and just, you know, to the point and direct. But taking some time, hey, before we start this meeting, how's everyone doing? Oh, well, my, my parents have a restaurant, it's been shut down. They have a, you know, a chain of restaurants, that's been, they've been shut down. I don't know how the, what they're gonna do. Really? Wow, okay. And other people just kind of checking in and having a more human touch. Because um, at the end of the day, um, work is important. Advertising is important. Uh, you know, ev everything we do to make a living, I don't think people's professional lives should stop because of a pandemic. It can't because the economy would stop. But I think uh, we need to be, take the opportunity to be better managers, uh, better executives and be more kind to each other and empathetic. And I think uh, that's gonna go a long way. Yeah, I think that's great. Catherine, yeah. Oh yeah, I, mean, I think Andrew and Marcel have covered a lot of the common themes that, that we've seen as well. Um, but just two things I would add. One, you know, I think openness from, from leaders in terms of the struggles they're facing, we, we found that to, to really help in building that empathy. Our CEO has young children and we've all been on Zoom calls with him and seen them in the background. And that's an aspect of, of his life and he's dealing with homeschooling the same as many other of his employees. And it's creating a little more connection. I was on a call with an SVP and he was washing his dishes and I was like, wow, you, you deal with this too. Um, so I think they're, they're, you know, kind of acknowledging that we're all kind of struggling with the same things at, at, you know, regardless of what level. And then the other thing, you know, we've been trying to do is, is, and this has only been a little recent because I think, you know, the timeline for COVID keeps getting pushed out, but realizing we, we can't put all of our normal interactions on pause. So, you know, Re, um, reintroducing virtual, like coffee chats that, you know, you can't talk at the water cooler. Our company does still have a water cooler, so I don't know if everyone does. Um, but having a virtual coffee chat or a virtual lunch, and it's not the same, and we all get tired of, of video calls, but it lets you step out of the workplace and kind of connect more as human beings. So just my two, two cents there. 
That's great. Um, well, we're actually, we're getting close to time and we had a couple questions from um, our viewers online. So the first one, um, again, more in the vein of practical advice, uh, from a tactical perspective, how do you produce good creative and content in a sensitive environment on a truncated timeline? So you've got all the factors working for you. What do you focus on? What are your priorities? How do you make sure you don't miss something important? So um, jump ball on that one. <laughs> uh, I can start. Um, I mentioned that we had just launched a new campaign a few weeks ago. Um, we, at, as, as we launched the mini festo uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, a video to go along with it, um, and yes, a small bit of, bit of that video was captured in that awesome mashup of pandemic commercials. Um, but we still felt very proud of the work that we did. We were already thinking about what the next step was and um, wound up developing a very brief campaign that followed sort of the, the work that we had done over the last year, but brought it all into the home, uh, into individualized experiences. And we shot the entire campaign with one director in his home in suburban Washington with his family as the talent, three different spots. Um, uh, and uh, we were able to not only develop it, but shoot it and, and get it out the door in about four and a half weeks. Wow. And um, the, the campaign is great. It, if you didn't know the backstory, you would never guess that that was how it was created. Um, and uh, it's doing really well for us right now. And it did bring a little bit of humor back. Uh, just, I'll try and, I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, illustrate one, one of the spots is a teenage girl waking up at, from her alarm and running over to her computer to get onto a Zoom call with her class uh, and then realizing that it's actually Saturday and <laughs> there is no class. Um, so that's not, a, that's not a spot about home buying, right? But it is a spot about what we're all dealing with at home right now, or, or the mom who's short commute from one side of the couch where she's watching uh, TV to the other where her computer is to get on a video chat with her, with her, um, with her team is, is just another example. So um, it all happened very fast and hopefully we won't have to create things as quickly in the future, but it was a really great opportunity for us to sort of flex not only the creative muscle, but strategic thinking to, to deliver good creative. I wanted to add to that because um, we do political advertising. And so obviously there's, we're in a bunch of primaries right now. We've uh, done a lot of ads. And so um, we, I think we just sent somebody on location for the first time since this started. Um, but people have directors of ads have been directing on FaceTime. Uh, we've had different candidates kind of film themselves with the first thing we have to tell them is go horizontal. Uh, so basic things like that and say it 50 times because 49 are going to be horrible. Um, and we're going to use one and, you know, going out and shooting B roll from afar. Um, and the ads have kind of been cut in paste. Um, but I think um, most advertisers and producers and directors would say that editors have never been more, um, appreciated, um, I think, um, in this time, because they're really making the magic happen by pasting everything together, editing it together, and making it look seamless. So um, a lot of um, uh, tripods for the cell phone have been sent to candidates and their staff, as well as the famous rings, um, and it's kind of uh, DI, do it yourself, um, but that's what we've had to do we, to protect people. Is, um, I'm a little less on the on the advertising and brand side, but um, we do a lot of we do we do a lot of research at NRF, and, and as a result of COVID, we're doing a lot of our brand and marketing research in house. Um, but you know, we're in the midst of looking at a couple of different campaigns we want to roll out. And um, you, know, you, you can't do away with market research. <laughs> um, so we've had to find tools. We just did a survey of and some message testing of 6,000 consumers and we did it in three days, um, which is not something we would have done in the past. Um, and you have to, you know, honestly there, look at different tools. You can do it cost effectively. Um, and it, it was good because we also needed to make some adjustments after that. Um, but 
yeah, I think you just have to be really flexible in terms of your resources um, without, you know, making sure you, you don't sacrifice like true quality, um, not necessarily just lighting, but the actual effectiveness of the messaging. Yeah. All right. So we are almost at time. So I'm going to do one last question from the group and this will be our, our closing question. Um, what of the changes you've seen in your own operations and your own sort of development and creativity do you think will stick versus what do you think will go back to the way it was assuming a widely available vaccine which seems to be the thing that will get people back to normal so it's a broad question you can take it any way you want but i think that the sort of general view is what's going to go back to normal and what is the new normal from your points of view as it relates to, to creativity and, and really sort of um, building great brands. So I guess, Marcella, we'll start with I'll you. Start. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that uh, you're going to see corporate travel uh, go really down. I mean, I used to fly to Mexico City for a half hour meeting, um, literally, uh, and I think uh, paid for by clients. And I don't think that they're going to do that anymore when we can just as easily do it like this. Um, obviously, in person is always going to be better. We're humans. But um, if you think from a cost effectiveness and also a time effectiveness, right? Your employees can be more productive. And frankly, for those of us who, tra who have traveled a lot, we'd rather be at home with our families. We'd rather not be in an airport and going through security and you know, being on a plane. So um, I think you'll definitely see that. Um, and I also think that um, there's gonna be, I agree with Catherine, more social activities. Uh, we did a, we had some mixologists uh, give classes and we had like a virtual happy hour, but also you learned something. So that was pretty cool. I think you'll see that. And from an advertising point of view, you won't see this uh, probably for CPG or bigger brands and companies, but for political campaigns, which are very scrappy and money is always an issue and resources are always an issue. I would imagine if they, if the ads look almost as good or just as good um, with this new way of doing it, I, I predict that it will, it will happen more. Catherine? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think similar things to what Marcel is saying, you know, I think there is going to be, I think there's a little bit more of a, of a focus on people being holistic people uh, with kids and, you know, you don't just come to the office and leave your family at home. Now our offices are at home for the most part. And even I think when we're back in physical spaces, there's going to be an acknowledgement that people um, bring a lot more to the table. Um, I think of, from the from ourselves and also from groups we've, we've been working with, you know, this, this whole, a little bit of a flattening of the organization. Um, you know, a lot of leaders of retail companies and our CEO too have been talking to employees on a really regular basis. Um, and I think that's healthily opened up a lot of communication and sort of you know, taken away some of the walls between C-suite and the rest of the, of the company. And um, not just at ours, I've, I've seen it elsewhere too. Um, and I think that is going to, to continue and kind of more of a free flow of, of information. Um, in terms of what's going to go back, you know, I, I agree that travel is probably going to get cut down, but I think in-person meetings will still be valued. I think we're all learning what we actually get out of in-person networking and, and the, you know, other aspects of meeting, hopefully not just for a half hour. Um, but, you know, when you can put together something thoughtful, it can be really valuable and provide something we're, we're kind of missing right now. Yeah. Andrew? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the biggest change that, and, and I agree with everything that, that Catherine and Marcella said, I, I think the one thing, the one additional thing that's going to change, and, and Realtor.com has nothing really to do with commercial real estate, but the entire commercial real estate industry, business real estate offices are never going to be quite the way they were before. I think there will probably be a lot more fluidity between people coming and going and working at home versus working in an office. Um, and there probably won't be as many individual offices. You know, there's going to be a lot more open. I, I would guess there's going to be a lot more open space floor plans and, and, and really people have figured out incredibly quickly how to do their work without three walls and a glass door or without a conference room. And, and, and so I just, I think that the nature of work is going to change and how we do our work is going to change. 
Maybe that'll be our our next webinar, the future of work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, thank you all so much, Andrew, Catherine, Marcella, for, for being a part of today's conversation. Um, join us next week uh, for another great conversation on food and the pandemic. Um, but, you know, this has been really insightful. I so appreciate all of your time. Thank you to everyone who joined. Um, please be safe. Uh, I will go ahead and show my bias, but wear a mask. <laughs> and uh, thank you again. Have a great rest of your week and a nice weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.